Our topic for today is about all the basic in EKG or ECG reading. ECG is a graphic recording of the electrical potentials generated by the depolarization and repolarization of the atria and ventricles of the heart. Electrodes attached to extremities and chest wall detect the heart's electrical activity, which can be seen on surface ECG as waveforms that are labeled alphabetically as P, Q, R, S, T, and with or without U wave. So basically, you see positive deflection, negative deflection, or just isoelectric baseline. But what do these deflections mean? Honestly, the feeling is like a nightmare if you're given with an ECG tracing, but you don't know what to look for. So today, we will try to acquaint ourselves with electrocardiogram or ECG. Let us review first the normal electrical conduction of the heart. Normally, conduction starts from the normal pacemaker of the heart, which is a sinoatrial node or SA node, which has an inherent beat of 60 to 100 beats per minute. SA node is located at the right atrial superior vena caval junction. By virtue of the location of the SA node, the right atrium contracts first by a few milliseconds than the left atrium. Nevertheless, both atria seemingly contract simultaneously because the electrical conduction rapidly travels from the right atrium to the left atrium through the Bachmann bundle. The depolarization of both atria can be seen as P wave and surface ECG. The impulses from the SA node travels to the atrioventricular node or AV node and bundle of his. AV node is located at the apex of triangle of coach. It is a subsidiary pacemaker with an inherent beat of 40 to 60 bits per minute. AV node together with bundle of his is called atrioventricular junction, which acts as the gatekeeper that allows or inhibits impulse to pass through and reach the ventricle. The physiologic delay of impulse conduction from SA node to AV node can be seen on surface ECG as PR interval. This physiologic delay makes sure that atria contract first, allowing time for transporting blood from atria to ventricle before ventricle contract and eject blood to the pulmonary circulation or systemic circulation. Now the bundle of his bifurcates into two main branches, the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch. The main left bundle bifurcates into two primary subdivisions, namely the left anterior fascicle and the left posterior fascicle. So from the right bundle branch and left anterior and posterior fascicles, Depolarization wave fronts travel to the Purkinje fibers before it spread to the ventricular wall, depolarizing the wall from innermost to outermost ventricular layers, so from endocardium to myocardium to epicardium. Interventricular septum depolarizes first from left to right direction, which is responsible for the first part of QRS complex, before the entire ventricle depolarizes, which is responsible for the rest of the QRS complex. Therefore, the entire ventricular depolarization can be seen on surface ECG as QRS complex. Conducting system below the bundle of his is also a subsidiary pacemaker with an inherent beat of 20 to 40 beats per minute. While the ventricles undergo depolarization, concomitantly atria undergo repolarization. However, atrial repolarization cannot be seen on surface ECG because it is too low in amplitude so it is buried within the QRS complex. Then ventricles undergo repolarization which can be seen on surface ECG as T wave. To review, electrical conduction starts at the SA node, to AV node, to bundle of his, to bundle branches. Then electrical conduction travels to Purkinje fibers then reaches the ventricles. On surface ECG, P wave represents atrial depolarization. QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization, and T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Atrial repolarization normally cannot be seen because it is buried within the QRS complex. We are already acquainted with the electrical conducting system of the heart. Let us now proceed to ECG leads. Before we will discuss electrodes and leads, please take note that an electrode is the actual conductive pad attached to the body surface area while well, a lead is the electrical potential difference between a positive electrode and a negative electrode or a reference point. So ECG lead can either be bipolar lead or unipolar lead. When we say bipolar lead, it is composed of two electrodes of opposite polarity, 
one positive and one negative, while unipolar lead is composed of one positive surface electrode and a reference point. Standard 12 lead ECG is composed of three bipolar limb leads, three unipolar limb leads, and six unipolar chest leads. The six limb leads record potentials transmitted onto the frontal plane, while the six chest leads record potentials transmitted onto the horizontal plane. The three bipolar limb leads are leads 1, 2, and 3. Lead 1 records electrical differences between right arm negative electrode and left arm positive electrode. Lead 2 records electrical differences between right arm negative electrode and left leg positive electrode. And lead 3 records electrical differences between left arm negative electrode and left leg positive electrode. Plotting the three bipolar limb leads, you see this plot. The three unipolar limb leads are AVR, AVL, and AVF. AV stands for augmented V. R stands for right arm, L stands for left arm, and F stands for foot. In AVR, the positive electrode is on the right arm. And negative reference point is the average of left arm and left leg electrodes. In AVL, the positive electrode is on the left arm. And the negative reference point is the average of right arm and left leg electrodes. And in AVF, the positive electrode is on the left leg, and the negative reference point is the average of right arm and left arm electrodes. Although F stands for foot, please conceptualize that the positive electrode of AVF as being at the umbilicus. Plotting the three augmented unipolar limb leads, you see this plot. And combining the six limb leads, you will see this plot along the frontal plane. And the six unipolar chest leads are V1 to V6. The negative reference point of the six chest leads is the Wilson Central Terminal, which is computed by connecting all three limp electrodes to one terminal. So Wilson Central Terminal is located approximately in the center of the thorax. That is the negative reference point. Each chest lead consists of a positive electrode strategically placed on the chest of the patient. The proper position of the positive electrode for the six chest leads is essential for a valid tracing to be made on the ECG machine. With these six chest leads, you will see this plot along the horizontal plane. Again, we have three bipolar limb leads, three unipolar limb leads, and six unipolar chest leads. And combining all the 12 leads, you see this plot. After performing a 12 lead ECG, you see this normal ECG tracing. Why are some leads inverted, some are upright, and some have equal positive and negative deflections? This can be explained by the golden rule in electrocardiogram reading which is, if the flow of the electrical impulse is towards the lead, it gives a positive deflection. If the flow of the electrical impulse is away from the lead, it gives a negative deflection. Knowing that the electrical impulse starts from the right to the left, inferiorly laterally and posteriorly, right-sided leads like AVR, V1, and V2 normally have negative deflection because the flow of the electrical impulse is away from these leads. The transition from negative deflection to positive deflection happens at V3 or V4, which makes the positive and negative deflections almost equal. And since the electrical impulse flows inferiorly to the left, laterally and posteriorly, 2-3 AVF, 1 AVL, and V4, V5, and V6 normally have positive deflection. After knowing the basic physiology of electrical conduction system of the heart, you are now ready to determine the rate, rhythm, PR interval, QRS complex, axis, SC segment, T wave, QT interval, and interpretation. I will give you time to get a pen a paper or notebook for jotting down notes and some computation and a calculator because we will have an ECG reading workshop. This is an ECG tracing paper. You see small boxes measuring 1 by 1 millimeter. You also see big boxes containing 5 small boxes vertically and 5 small boxes horizontally. Looking at the boxes horizontally, it represents time. Looking at the boxes vertically, it represents amplitude. Normal standardization is speed of 25 mm per second and amplitude of 10 mm per millivolt. 
Therefore, with normal standardization, one small box horizontally is equivalent to 0.04 seconds, and one small box vertically is equivalent to 0.1 millivolt. Any changes from this normal standardization, like speed 50 millimeters per second, or amplitude of 20, 5, or 2.5 millimeters per millivolt, should be noted because it affects final ECG interpretation. Let us start with the determination of heart rate which can be classified as normal if the heart rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute, pericardia if it's less than 60 beats per minute, or tachycardia if it's more than 100 beats per minute. The first thing that you need to check is if the R to R interval is regular or not. You may use caliper to check the regularity of the R to R interval. But most of the time, you don't have a caliper, so you may just use pen and paper. So how do we do this? Place the edge of the paper just immediately below the tip of the R wave. Mark two successive R waves, then place it to another R to R interval, and another R to R interval. If it perfectly fits, then it is regular. But if it doesn't fit, more likely it is irregular. For regular R to R interval, you count the number of small boxes in an R to R interval. After counting, you use the formula heart rate is equals to 1500 divided by the number of small boxes in R to R interval. In this ECG tracing, there are 19 small boxes. So using the formula 1500 divided by 19, the heart rate is 79 beats per minute. For a regular R to R interval, you cannot use this formula. We learned earlier that one small box is 0.04 seconds, so one big box is 0.2 seconds, and five big boxes is one second. Therefore, 30 big boxes is equal to 6 seconds. And knowing that the heart rate is the number of beats in 1 minute or 60 seconds, we can determine the heart rate by counting the number of QRS complexes in 30 big boxes multiplied by 10. So the formula in determining the heart rate in a regular R to R interval is heart rate is equals to number of QRS complexes in 30 big boxes times 10. So for example, in this case, there are 9 QRS complexes within 30 big boxes. So heart rate is 9 times 10 which is equal to 90, so heart rate is 90 beats per minute. So for another ECG tracing, determine the heart rate assuming that the R to R interval is regular. If your answer is 75 beats per minute, which is a normal heart rate, then you are right. How about this ECG tracing? What is the heart rate? If your answer is 100 beats per minute, which is a normal heart rate, then your answer is right. How about this ECG tracing? What is the heart rate? If your answer is 37.5 or 38 beats per minute, which is bradycardia, you got it wrong. Why? Take note that the paper speed it is tracing is 50 millimeters per second, which is twice the normal standardization of 25 millimeters per second. So in this tracing, you count the small boxes first, then divide it by 2 before you compute for the heart rate. Therefore, 40 small boxes divided by 2 is equal to 20 small boxes. So, heart rate is 1,500 divided by 20 small boxes, which is equals to 75 beats per minute, and that is still a normal heart rate. How about in this ECG tracing, what is the heart rate? If your answer is 42 beats per minute, which is bradycardia, you are just partially correct. Why? Well, in this tracing, there is atrioventricular dissociation. Atrial depolarization, as reflected by P waves, has different rate with ventricular depolarization reflected as QRS complexes. So atrial rate should be calculated separately from ventricular rate. In ventricular rate, you count the number of small boxes in an R to R interval, just like what we did in the previous examples. So ventricular rate is 1,500 divided by 36 small boxes, which is equal to 42 beats per minute. On the other hand, atrial rate is determined by counting the number of small boxes in a P2P interval, so from the beginning of a P wave up to the start of the next P wave. In this case, there are 12 small boxes, so using the formula heart rate equals to 1,500 divided by number of small boxes, the atrial rate is 125 beats per minute, which is tachycardia.
So in this tracing, ventricular rate is 42 beats per minute, while atrial rate is 125 beats per minute. Next step is determination of rhythm. As what was discussed earlier, the normal pacemaker of the heart is the sinoatrial node. If the impulse is coming from the sinoatrial node, we call that a sinus rhythm or sinus bradycardia or sinus tachycardia depending on the heart rate. How do we know that the impulse is coming from the sinus node? Go back to the golden rule of ECG reading which is, if the flow of the electrical impulse is towards the lead, it gives a positive deflection. If the flow of the electrical impulse is away from the lead, it gives a negative deflection. Therefore, you expect that if the rhythm is coming from the sinus node, the P waves should be upright in 2-3 AVF and inverted in AVR. That is the only surface ECG criterion that tells you that the rhythm is sinus. If it is neither upright in 2-3 AVF nor inverted in AVR, most likely it is not sinus like in the case of atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, among others. Nevertheless, take note that normal P wave in V1 may be biphasic with a positive component reflecting right atrial depolarization followed by a small negative component reflecting left atrial depolarization. So in this tracing, what is the rhythm? If your answer is sinus, you are correct because P waves are upright in 2-3 AVF and inverted in AVR. How about this tracing? What is the rhythm? If your answer is non-sinus, you are correct. You cannot see any discernible P waves. What you can see are just atrial fibrillatory waves. After determining the rate and rhythm, the next step is determining the PR interval in seconds. How do we determine the PR interval? We'll just count the small boxes from the start of the P wave to the start of the Q wave. One small box is equivalent to 0 0.04 seconds. So PR interval is the number of small boxes multiplied by 0 0.04 seconds. Normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. Short PR interval might indicate presence of an accessory pathway, while prolonged PR interval might indicate a trioventricular block. So for example, in this tracing, there are four small boxes. So the PR interval is 4 times 0 0.04, which is equal to 0.16 seconds, which is normal. In this tracing, which is an atrial fibrillation, you cannot see clear discernible P waves, so the PR interval can be reported as indeterminate. In this another tracing with Wenckebach phenomenon, the PR intervals are prolonging so they have different measurement. You may report variable plus the measurement of the shortest and the longest PR interval as the range. So in this tracing, the shortest is 0.12 seconds, while the longest is 0.28 seconds. So the PR interval can be reported as a variable at 0.12 to 0.28 seconds. Next step is to determine the axis. The normal axis is negative 30 to positive 100 degrees. Axis less than negative 30 degrees is left axis deviation. Axis more than positive 100 degrees is right axis deviation. An axis less than negative 90 degrees or more than positive 180 degrees is extreme axis deviation. Well, there are a lot of methods on how to determine the axis. You can use formula, quadrant method, three lead method, isoelectric lead method, or just the thumb rule. For an easier and more practical method, we will use the thumb rule and the formula method depending on the situation. If you are in a hurry, you may just use the thumb rule. In thumb rule, the left thumb represents lead 1, while the right thumb represents lead AVF. The direction of each thumb is determined whether the QRS complex is predominantly positive, which is going up, or predominantly negative, which is going down. Normal axis is QRS complexes of both leads 1 and AVF are positive deflection, so both thumbs are pointing upward. Again, both thumbs are pointing upward, so normal axis. If lead 1 is negative, so left thumb points downward, and AVF is positive, so right thumb points upward, it is right axis deviation. Again, only right thumb points up, so right axis deviation. If lead 1 is positive, so left thumb points upward, and AVF is negative, so right thumb points downward, 
it is a left axis deviation. Again, only the left thumb points upward, so left axis deviation. If both leads 1 and ABF have negative deflections, so both thumbs are pointing downward, that is extreme axis deviation. Again, both thumbs are pointing downward, so extreme axis deviation. This is the summary of thumb rule to estimate axis. Remember that the thumb rule is just estimation. In some instances, when using thumb rule, you might get left or right axis deviation, but upon calculation using a formula, it is still normal axis. So just use the thumb rule when you are in a hurry and don't have the luxury of time. The formula to determine the axis is axis is equals to 90, which is constant, times the value of lead AVF divided by the absolute value of lead 1 plus the absolute value of lead AVF. How do we get the value of leads 1 and AVF then? Just look at the QRS complex of lead 1, then identify the isoelectric baseline. Count the small boxes going up and separately count the small boxes going down and get their difference. That is the value of lead 1. And you do the same with lead AVF to get its value. The AVF here as numerator can be positive or negative integer. On the other hand, the denominators are absolute values. This means that you just use the number without carrying either positive or negative sign. For example, if the value of lead 1 is positive 5, just use 5. If it is negative 5, still use 5 without carrying the negative sign. There is also an additional step in getting the final axis if the value of lead 1 is a negative integer. This additional formula is final axis is equals to 180 which is constant minus whatever the answer using this formula. Again, this is the formula in getting the axis. Moreover, if the value of lead 1 is a negative integer, you proceed with this additional step to get the final axis. So let us have a sample tracing. Determine the axis by thumb rule and formula method. Using the thumb rule, the axis is normal because both leads 1 and AVF are predominantly positive deflections. For the formula method, the axis is positive 64 degrees, which is normal. How did we get this axis? First, let us identify the value of leads 1 and AVF. For lead 1, there are 5 small boxes for positive deflection and nothing for negative deflection. So the value of lead 1 is positive 5. For lead AVF, 13 small boxes for positive deflection and 1 small box for negative deflection. So the value of lead AVF is positive 12. So using the formula, axis is equals to 90 times the value of lead AVF which is positive 12 divided by the absolute value of lead 1 which is 5 plus absolute value of lead AVF, which is 12. So the axis is positive 64 degrees. Question is, do we need to proceed to this additional step? No, because the value of lead 1 is positive. So final axis is positive 64 degrees, which is normal. Another tracing determine the axis by thumb rule and formula method. By thumb rule, it is right axis division because lead 1 is predominantly negative deflection while lead AVF is predominantly positive deflection. Confirming it with formula method, in lead 1 there are 2 small boxes for positive deflection and 4 small boxes for negative deflection. So the value of lead 1 is negative 2. In lead AVF, there are 12 small boxes for positive deflection and 1 small box for negative deflection. So the value of lead AVF is positive 11. Using the formula, axis is equals to 90 times lead AVF, which is positive 11, divided by absolute value of lead 1, which is 2, plus absolute value of lead AVF, which is 11. So the axis is positive 76 degrees. But since the value of lead 1 is negative integer, we need to proceed to a further step to get the final axis. So 180 minus 76 degrees, so the final axis is positive 104 degrees, which is classified as right axis deviation. We are done with the rate, rhythm, PR interval, and axis. So the next step is to determine the QRS complex. QRS complex has three components, the Q wave, the R wave, and the S wave. Normal QRS interval is less than 0.12 seconds or less than three small boxes. How to determine the QRS interval? 
Just count the number of small boxes from the start of the Q wave to the end of the S wave and multiply by 0 0.04. So for example, in this ECG tracing, there are two small boxes from the start of Q wave to the end of S wave. So the QRS interval is 0 0.08 seconds, which is normal. How about in this example? If your answer is 0 0.16 seconds, which is prolonged, then you got it right. After the QRS interval, the next step is to determine the ST segment which is a short segment from the end of S wave to the beginning of the T wave. ST segment can be reported as isoelectric which is normal, elevated, or depressed. This is normal ST segment which is isoelectric. This is ST elevation which might indicate myocardial infarction, pericarditis, and other reasons. This is ST depression which might indicate myocardial ischemia, electrolyte imbalance, and other reasons. And if you find any ST segment abnormality, you need to specify the involved leads in your report. Again, ST segment can be reported as isoelectric if there are no identified abnormalities, elevated, or depressed. For example, in this tracing, how do you report the ST segment? So look at leads 1 AVL, 2 3 AVF, AVR, V1 V2, V3 V4, V5 V6. There are neither elevation nor depression, so report ST segment as isoelectric. How about in this example? How do you report the ST segment? So look at leads 1 and AVL, which are depressed. Leads 2 3 AVF, which are elevated. AVR is isoelectric. Leads V1, V3, V4, V5, V6 are isoelectric. Lead V2 is depressed. So you report ST segment is elevated in leads 2, 3 AVF and depressed in leads 1, AVL, and V2. We are done with rate, rhythm, PR interval, axis, QRS interval, and ST segment. The next step in the ECG reading is to determine the T wave. Normally, T wave is upright, except in leads AVR and V1 when T wave is normally inverted. T wave can be reported as upright, which is normal, flattened, inverted, or peak. The normal upright is when T wave is a positive deflection, flattened if it is along the isoelectric baseline. It can happen if there is electrolyte abnormality, anemia, and other reasons. Inverted if T wave is a negative deflection. It can happen if there is myocardial ischemia, electrolyte imbalance, anemia, and other reasons. Or T wave can be a peak T wave if it's more than 10 small boxes in chest leads or more than 5 small boxes in limb leads. This might happen in hyperkalemia or hyperacute myocardial infarction. If there is T wave abnormality, you need to specify the involved leads in your report. Otherwise, just report upright T waves. Again, T wave can be reported as upright if there are no T wave abnormalities. Flattened, inverted, or peaked. So, for example, in this ECG tracing, how do you report T wave? So, look at 1 AVL, 2 3 AVF, AVR, V1 V2, V3 V4, and V5 V6. All leads are upright, so you write in the report T waves are upright. How about this ECG tracing? How do you report the T waves? T waves are inverted in leads 1 AVL, V1 V2, V3 V4, and V5 V6. And lastly, determine the QT interval which encompasses both the ventricular depolarization and repolarization. QT interval varies inversely with the heart rate. It prolongs in bradycardia and shortens in tachycardia. Normal QT interval is 0.35 to 0.44 seconds. Some references would say that normal QT is 0.35 to 0.43 seconds for male and 0.35 to 0.45 seconds for female. QT might prolong in hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, prolonged QT syndrome, and other reasons. QT might shorten in hypercalcemia, digoxin effect, short QT syndrome, and other reasons. Any lead can be used to measure the QT interval. Nevertheless, leads 2 or V5 or V6 are recommended. 
On surface ECG, QT interval can be determined by counting the small boxes from the start of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. If U wave is fused with a T wave, then include U wave in measuring the QT interval. Otherwise, do not include U wave. Then multiply the number of small boxes from Q to T or U wave by 0.04 seconds. The answer is the actual QT interval or QTA. If the heart rate is bradycardic or tachycardic, or QTA is prolonged, corrected QT interval or QTC should be computed because again, QT interval varies inversely with the heart rate. There are several formulae that can be used to compute for QTC or corrected QT like the Bazet's formula, Friedericia formula, Framingham formula, or the Hodges formula. For our discussion, let us just use the Bazet's formula. The Bazet's formula is corrected QT is equals to actual QT in seconds divided by the square root of R to R duration in seconds. For example, in this tracing, the number of small boxes from the start of Q to the end of the T is 9 small boxes. So multiply it by 0.04, the actual QT interval is 0.36 seconds, which is normal. How about the QTC? Count the number of small boxes in an R to R interval. In this tracing, it is 20, so the R to R duration is 0.80 seconds. So using the Bazet's formula and getting the corrected QT, corrected QT is equals to actual QT which is 0.36 seconds divided by the square root of R to R duration of 0.80 seconds. So the corrected QT is 0.40 seconds which is normal. How about in this ECG tracing? What is the actual QT and corrected QT intervals? In this case, U wave is fused with a T wave, so you include that in the QT determination. Some may call it as QU interval. If your answer for actual QT interval is 0.68 seconds, which is prolonged, then you got it right. If your answer for the corrected QT is 0.72 seconds, which is also prolonged, then you got it right as well. We are done with how to determine rate, rhythm, PR interval, axis, QRS complex interval, ST segment, T wave, and QTA and QTC intervals. Now let us apply what we just learned by answering this sample ECG tracing. The answers are rate of 71 bits per minute which is normal, rhythm is sinus which is normal, PR interval is 0.16 seconds which is also normal, Axis is positive 64 degrees, which is normal. QRS complex is 0 0.08 seconds, which is normal. ST segment is isoelectric, which is normal. T wave is upright, which is normal. QTA is 0 0.36 seconds, which is normal. And QTC is 0 0.39 seconds, which is still normal. So the interpretation is normal sinus rhythm.